Our Lady, Mother of Mercy, pray, pray for us. us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, amen. Lauren, and thank you, everybody who is joining us. It's an honor for me to be here with Jonathan, who plays Jesus, as you know, on The Chosen. We know it. Everybody sold out here really quick, but we have limited seating, so God bless you guys could make it with us. I blame okay. you for that. Yes. I blame you for no, the sellout. You. So real quick, we, we, we apologize for having to rapid fire through these questions, but I want to say anything to the viewers. I actually will answer every one that I don't get to tonight personally by email when you submitted the questions. And I think, Lauren, we have all the emails with them. So I will personally answer all of those. So please don't get disappointed if we don't get to your question. So um, I will do that. All right, first question is right from here in Birmingham, Alabama, Priscilla. Do we have Priscilla with us? She said, "Does what does forgive mean? How do you live forgiveness towards someone? And what is required to for one to have forgiven? Okay, real quick, this is amazing. People don't understand, forgive does not necessarily mean reconciliation. It does not necessarily mean that you have to become the best friends with somebody. I had somebody steal $2,000 from me, an employee. I did not have to go out to dinner with them and become their best friend. I forgave them, but you can believe I fired them. You see, forgiveness simply means you let go, you wish them well, you don't have to reconcile, but if you do reconcile, now you've elevated yourself up to mercy. Mercy is actually greater than forgiveness. Amen to that. And I also want to say that um, if I don't get to all of my questions, Father Chris will be answering <laughs> them all personally. So just want to make that clear. You get with that? Good. So um, <clears throat> my first question comes from Sophia in Beaumont, California whom I can only assume is watching by live stream. She asks, what is the most important part for you in preparing for your role of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in The Chosen? Uh, I'd say the most important part for me is prayer. Um, part of my preparation when we were filming on location in Texas for season one was finding a local church and making sure I could get to mass. Uh, if there was confessions going, I'd get to confession and then as often as I could receive the Eucharist, uh, t being that it's the source and summit of our faith, it for me was also the source, summit, and strength of what was um, bringing, my, uh, bringing the work that I was doing to a level that, that I couldn't do on my own. So I would say prayer is the, uh, the, the defining factor for me in um, preparing for the, the chosen or any time that I've played. Um, Jesus, which has been outside of the chosen as well. So, yeah. Awesome. This is from Janet in Trussville, Alabama. We're not just picking Alabama people here. This just happens to be coincidental. What is the most important thing we can do to foster the desire to join religious life or priesthood as Catholic parents? First of all, you need to surrender to let it be God's will, not your will. I've seen men in seminary. I've seen men in my own community that were there for their parents. When I personally came to seminary, my mom cried for three days. <laughs> my dad said I'd never make it as a priest, and my 82-year-old aunt said, I thought you liked girls. <laughs> I was engaged. I don't know why she asked that question. But here's what you do to foster. It's the same as bringing somebody back to the church. One, have masses said. They don't even have to know it. You can have masses said for them. I'm doing the same thing for fostering a vocation as it is bringing somebody back to the church, like your loved ones, brother, sister, children. Second, your personal prayer. Uh, Jonathan just mentioned the importance of personal prayer. Add them into your rosary. Add them into your chaplet of divine mercy. Third, you must portray joy. If somebody sees in you the Catholic faith is a drug a dredge on you and is dragging you down in guilt and depression and woe is me, God's sending me to hell if we don't do 65 rosaries this evening, get up here or you're going to hell with me, ain't going to work. You need to portray joy. And finally, number four, offer up everything that happens to you, good, bad, joy, suffering. You stub your toe offer that up. You, you, you get passed over for a promotion, offer it up. Everything that we do, offer it up because those graces can be used to foster vocations and returns to the church. 
And I only recently found out that you, 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 people can say and should say intentions for other people that aren't just you know, sick and dying. Uh, for yes. instance, I got texts very recently because somebody wanted to say a mass for me. A, a fan called up a church and had a mass sent for me, and I, and my local church. And I got, started getting texts from friends saying, are you okay? <laughs> like, I, I heard your name come up at mass. I'm like, what? Uh, when, yeah, no, I, say, I guess it just doesn't have to be about right. sick and dying. Yeah. It's for whatever the intention is, and nobody has to know. So and I really if I like could that. add one last thing, do you know St. Anselm said, there's more value in a mass said for the living, that one mass for the living is worth more than 100 masses after somebody has deceased. Wow. So have those masses said for the living. Can you say masses for yourself if you're You can have a mass said for yourself. You can go right to your church, go to the rectory or to the parish office, say we'd like to have a mass said for your own intentions. Yep. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, Catherine from Suffern, New York asks me, did I attend Catholic schools for my elementary and high school education? No, I did not. In fact, anybody that I knew, friends of mine growing up that went to Catholic school usually left the faith afterwards. So for me, uh, my naive knowledge at the time was like, well, if you go to Catholic school, you become an agnostic or an atheist. So I'm glad I didn't go to Catholic school. Um, getting a little older now, I see a different value in it. And I also realized that so much depends upon the faith that you're raised with. So if you're bringing it in the home, um, that is a huge influence on a child and a young person's development. Um, to quote Father Patrick Payton, the family that prays together stays together. And uh, that's something that has truly helped me throughout my life. Awesome. We got international questions from all over. This is from Sakani from South Africa. So hopefully you're watching Sakani from South Africa. I don't know what time it would be over there, but it would be late. Um, are we supposed to pray the Chaplet of Divine Mercy only at 3 p.m.? Okay, great question. Actually, you know what the Lord said to do at 3 p.m.? He said pray the Chaplet, right? Wrong. First thing you do at 3 p.m. is the most powerful prayer you can make for conversion of sinners. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on, and you can say for me, a poor sinner, or for a sinner that you know has fallen away. Have mercy on John Smith, you know, of, to come back to the church. Secondly, he said, if you can't, um, the most important thing to do is pray for conversion of sinners. Next, do the stations of the cross. He said, if you can't do that, step inside a church or chapel and adore me in the blessed sacrament for but a moment. He said, if you can't do that, stop where you are for but a moment and meditate on my passion. That's what he said to do at three o'clock. He never said to pray the chaplet at three o'clock. Why do we pray the chaplet at three o'clock? Because everything he said to do at three o'clock revolved around his passion. And what's the chaplet of divine mercy? About his passion for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. So what we do at the three o'clock hour by praying the chaplet is honoring our Lord's request to meditate on his passion. Amy from Orem, Utah. I am not Catholic, but I started joining your prayer hour on Instagram. I have grown to love the Divine Mercy <clears throat> Chaplet. What specifically about the Divine Mercy Chaplet brings you comfort and peace? Um, part of that is indescribable, the answer to that question. It's just a feeling, um, but also the fact that I think, it's, I think that's rooted for me in trying to bring myself closer to Christ's passion, to um, really place myself at the foot of the cross and to understand uh, the sacrifice that Christ made on behalf of all mankind, that even um, beaten, bruised, and scourged, and literally uh, a bleeding mess on the cross. God forgive me, you understand what I'm saying. Um, like, when you're scourged, you don't stop bleeding. You're continually bleeding. And then to have nails driven in your hands and your feet, and you're still bleeding from all the scourging. And then at that point, to be able to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's the example that was set for us. So if I can pray the chaplet as a, as a minor, minor, infinitesimal token of my appreciation for the sacrifice of Christ, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. So, and, that's, and I get peace from that. I, I can't explain it. It wouldn't sound like it based on everything that I'm thinking about as I'm praying, but uh, it gives me peace to connect to Christ. Thank you, Jonathan. Jenny from Fort Wayne said, is there a particular person that had a positive influence on your faith journey? Yes, Father Rue, if you are watching out there in Charlotte, North Carolina, 
He was the first one that shocked my daylights when he said, I think you might be called to the priesthood. I ran, I hid, I never thought I was called to the priesthood. If somebody would have said to me in a high school senior class that you would become a priest, I had an appointment to the Air Force Academy. All I wanted to do was fly fighter jets. And um, if somebody would have said to me, you'd become a priest, I would have cried, just like my mom. So uh, definitely a very positive influence. And, you know, uh, three other people that have had positive influences are the three people that brought me down here. Uh, brother, or I used to say brother, David Blazeland, who, who drove us this entire way. Talk about a good heart, a man of God. And when I see somebody like that, he's always looking for the positive. When I'm looking for something to say, oh, can you believe they did that? He'll come up, I'll say, can you believe that they ate all my pizza? And he would say, you know, maybe they haven't eaten in 16 days. And so he'll see the positive. Uh, the other one is who we call Mama Giuseppe. She is Giuseppe, who also came down with me, my cameraman, who has just been a spiritual mother to us. She's from Italy, beautiful, just a soul of a great example. She rode the whole way, three straight days of driving, 1,500 miles, and not a peep from her, just a beautiful soul. And then my cameraman, Giuseppe, who's back there, uh, has been a great, great influence on me. I yell at him all the time, all the time. He's forgetting to do something. But you know, um, there's a guy that is giving me an example. Um, he's an awesome Catholic man. And, uh, and I tell you, I hope he finds a good Catholic woman someday because uh, this guy is gonna make a good husband to somebody. And so uh, um, I just saw he has hashtag cameraman Giuseppe now as his, his handle, because I always say my cameraman Giuseppe, my cameraman Giuseppe when I do my videos. And so people, uh, people will see that hopefully and wish him well because he's on a good faith journey. So a lot of good influence. I think this man right here, uh, I met him only four years ago, but when I talked to him to three hours in the, or three o'clock in the morning the first <laughs> night, I hear I was the priest and I came out of that meeting thinking, man, I want to be more like this guy. Oh. You know, so uh, a lot of good influences. And uh, the beautiful people down here, Lauren and her husband, Casey, have opened their home to us. And people just come in and out that they just met and they're like family. I'm like, wow. She goes, that's what we do in the South. So it's, it's beautiful. So a lot of good influence. Back at you, buddy. And thank you, everybody, for here, for all the wonderful good that you've done for us and bringing us here. It's, it's been tremendous. Um, Kiana from Delaware asks, can you please explain the significance of a scapular? Who is on the scapular that you wear and why? I'm wearing a brown scapular. I'll see if I can... Right here, which is... Um, tradition has it, and I just learned the, the details of this today from Father over here, so I could answer this question appropriately as if I knew what I was talking about, which I don't. Um, but tradition holds that the scapular uh, was given by our Blessed Mother uh, to St. Simon of... St Simon of, Stock. Simon Stock, not Simon of Stock, Simon Stock. Simon Stock, yeah. There you go. Thank you, Father. Um, in the 16th century, and that uh, when the Blessed Mother appeared, she was wearing the, the habit of the Carmelite order. So it's, is it called a Carmelite scapular? Yeah, she brought them what a piece of the cloth is from the Carmelite habit that she handed to wear. When you wear the scapular, you may know the brown little patch there. That's why it's supposed to be cloth, but if your skin is allergic or whatnot, you can wear the metal. But it's it is like a, wool. It's wool. It's yeah. made of the cloth of the Carmelite uh, habit. The, the scapular means shoulder, actually. And so when you wear the scapular, it's supposed to mean it goes over the shoulder, and that's what the, you wear. And the protection, well, I'll let you finish, Jonathan. I'm so sorry. So the protection is that uh, after. It comes with something called a Sabatine privilege, which meant that after you died, the first Saturday after a person died that wore this scapular, they would be released from purgatory, which is not theology, but it's, uh, it's something that was revealed through a personal revelation to St. Simon Stock. Um, so it's not something that is ne necessary for salvation um, or anything like that, but uh, I guess it's, it's, it's a bonus, can we say? Extra grace. Extra grace. Extra grace is the technical term. Thank you. Okay, very good. Tina in Joshua Tree, California. 
I sure hope they haven't torn down Joshua Tree, right, and uprooted it, right, with all the unrest which we need to pray for. A lot of people don't know that the Chaplet of Divine Mercy is praying to God our Father, not the Son. I too made this mistake. Is there a certain diary number to help me make known this, uh, this uh, known to people? I'm sorry I didn't have a chance to look up the passage, but yes, very clearly, and do you know this as well, the Mass, people always think the prayers of the Mass are to Jesus. Who are the prayers of the Mass to? God the Father. The Father. And we're going to be talking about that today. That whole essence of divine mercy and the meaning of divine mercy wraps up in the prayers of the Mass to God the Father. You see, God, Mass is God offering God to God. God the Son being offered by God the Holy Spirit to God the Father in atonement for our sins and the sins of the whole world. Stay with us. During the talk, we'll be hitting on that. Anna in New York, New York, the city so nice, they named it twice. Aside from praying the rosary, is praying the Divine Mercy Chaplet your favorite? Why and how did you come to this devotion? Um, that's part of what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, is it my favorite? Uh, it, yes. I mean, I, I don't know that I can say I have favorites. I have favorite prayers for, at different times. Um, in, in my life, and uh, that's one that I, I do say it every day in addition to the rosary. I didn't always say it every day in addition to the rosary, um, but it's as my faith has grown, it's, it's just something that I've, I've chose, chosen to do. Um, so, uh, yeah. And the, yeah, and then the, uh, how I came to the devotion uh, will be part of my talk tonight. So. All right, so we have Inge in Kings Mountain, North Carolina. I didn't live too far from there. I understand the concept that God is outside of time, but sacred scripture and sacred tradition teach that at our death, our judgment is immediate. Therefore, I do not understand how one can pray for the salvation of one who is already dead, either by suicide or other causes. Can you please explain this contradiction? Thank you for writing this because this is exactly what my book is about. I co-authored a book with Jason, brother Jason Lewis. It's called After Suicide. There's hope for them and for you, <clears throat> meaning those who have died, them, and you, meaning you left behind. But it doesn't apply just to suicide. It applies to any kind of loss or tragic death. Now, this is an incredible concept. I can't answer it in less than a minute. But I would say, please, if you get a chance, after suicide, there's hope for them and you, grab it, pick it up. It, it goes into all this detail. Bottom line is this. God is omniscient and he's omnipotent. Omniscient meaning he knows everything. God is omnipotent meaning he's all powerful. What I'm going to do in essence, and maybe I'll get to it in my talk, but God knows every prayer you will ever make in your life even before you make it because he's omniscient. He has all knowing. He doesn't change your free will. It's foreknowledge. He also has the power to apply the graces that you make at any point in time. When I discovered after my grandmother's suicide for 10 years, I never prayed for her because I assumed she was in hell. I was told that was church teaching. When 10 years later, I found out that's not church teaching. And, um, and the reason is because she didn't have free will, one of the three conditions for a mortal sin. The only way you go to hell is to die in an unrepentant state of mortal sin. But the point is this. <clears throat> I thought for 10 years my grandmother was in hell and never prayed for her. You can't pray people out of hell. Once they're in hell, you can't pray for them. Then I learned because God is outside of time, he knows every single prayer you will ever pray and he can apply those graces even to the moment of someone's judgment. Don't believe me? Go to the Diary of St. Faustina, 1486. Go to the Diary of St. Faustina, 1698. What Jesus says is he comes to the soul three times and gives everyone that opportunity to accept him. The problem is if you haven't been living a good life, you may not recognize him. You need the sacraments, you need help. But I'll, I'll summarize it with this. God knows, and being outside of time, we're not outside of time, but God is, and he unites our prayers to be outside of time. You know, Jesus told St. Faustina that her prayers got him through the agony in the garden. Hold on here. When did St. Faustina live? Exactly 1,900 years after Jesus Christ. So how did St. Faustina's prayers help Jesus get through his passion? She wasn't even born yet. No, it was her grandma, the great, 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 great grandma. Nobody was even born yet in her. I mean, she wasn't born yet. Yet Jesus told her, your prayers got me through the garden. How is that concept? And then this is documented by Padre Pio. This is documented by the Franciscans. Padre Pio was once being evaluated by his doctor. 
And the doctor noticed Padre Pio was praying. And the doctor asked Padre Pio, what are you praying for? He said, the conversion and happy death of my grandfather. And the doctor said, well, I knew your grandfather. He died over 20 years ago. What are you talking about? He says, I know. But 25 years ago, God knew that I'd be here tonight making this prayer. And God can apply these graces from my prayers tonight back to my grandfather at the moment of his judgment. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean we can change history. We can't change the past. What we can do is supply the grace for those people at the moment that they die, even though your prayer comes years later. Please don't take just what I explain here as being definitive answer. Please get the book if you want to go deeper into that subject. Jeanette in Whiting, New Jersey. As you were learning about the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist, did you come to accept it immediately, that Jesus was fully present in the Eucharist, or was it something that you came to as you grew up, read the Bible, and drew closer to the Lord? I, I always accepted it. I just didn't really understand it until much later in life. I'm still trying to understand it. It's, I mean, it's part of the mystery um, of our faith uh, and, and the wonder um, you know, to accept and look at this host and see the living presence of body, blood, soul, divinity, flesh of Jesus Christ in this host, because uh, your mind tells you it's a piece of gluten and wafer, it's, you know, but in your spirit, you know, no, that's, that's Jesus. So um, I have a much different approach and, and appreciation for it now, uh, but I'd always believed it, uh, but now it just, I believe it so much more strongly, I guess is the best way I can say that. Thank you. Now, Lisa in Ludlow, Mass., which is not too far from us now, up at the Shrine of Divine Mercy. Um, how can a priest confect uh, an unconsecrated host to become Jesus in the Eucharist when he is living in sin and does not intend to follow the rubrics of the church um, perfectly? Will Jesus still be present in the Eucharist? Does anybody know the answer to that? Absolutely. There is something in the church called ex opere apparato, which means by the very fact that a sacrament is administered, the grace is given, regardless of who's ministering it. So if you have an ordained priest, by virtue of his priesthood, sadly, and I hate to say this, no matter what he has done, you are getting Jesus in the Eucharist. This is church teaching. It's called ex opere apparato. It's a Latin term for meaning by the very fact that it is administered, it has an effect. That's what a sacrament is. It's not a symbol. It's an efficacious sign, meaning it does something. What's a sacrament? A sacrament is an efficacious sign, meaning it does something instituted by Christ and entrusted to the church by which divine life is instilled in us. And so, yes, the priest pray for him, don't worry, it's not your job to deal with the priest. God will deal with the priest, okay? That's the bottom line. But he's not going to shortchange you because of the weakness of the priest. You come here, you will receive true body, as, you, as Jonathan just said, true body, blood, soul, and divinity. It's, it's also a good thing because then if we were to judge it that the priest couldn't administer the sacrament, yes. then how much less could we receive the sacrament as, as exactly. broken vessels ourselves? So, exactly. Uh, it's a very happy thing that that can still happen. Yes. Um, Danielle from New Brunswick, Canada, uh, has, uh, asks, how has your faith and personal relationship with Jesus impacted your career and life choices? Uh, I guess I would say that as I delve further into my walk with Christ, um, certain choices don't appeal to me anymore. Um, certain roles don't appeal to me anymore. Um, and e even before roles, auditions, there are certain things that I will read or you know, might come across my desk and I will decide whether or not I even want to audition for it. Uh, and so I'm a lot more sensitive to certain things, not because I feel that it's like, oh, it's part of the image. I have to keep a, you know, a spotless image. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very flawed human being. I just full stop. Let's just start with that fact. Um, so I, I can't have judgment on anything, on characters, uh, you know, especially characters that might have the opportunity to uh, grow or exhibit the mercy of God somehow, you know, even if it's a bad guy, I have no problem playing bad guys because 
bad people don't necessarily think of themselves as bad people. They're just broken. Their choices are poor. Uh, whatever they're, you know, they're whatever makes them seem to be bad people, uh, m more often than not, they, it's, a, it's a series of conscious or unconscious choices over the course of their lives that have turned them in one direction or another. Um, but now there are, you know, if I see certain characters where they don't, there's no development or they don't have that potential to kind of have a sort of an arc where, or it feels like God is not really working in this particular piece or they're or it's just kind of um, very one-dimensional uh, and uh, you know sensational for whatever happens in the script. Then I will I will just not look at those, regardless of of who's involved. Um, so I, I think that's how it's affected my career uh, very differently. And then also like relationships and people. It's you know there's a certain level of forgiveness and mercy that you can have, and but but then you know you you realize um, your worth in Christ and that you don't need to, you know, forgiveness and mercy does not necessarily mean that you need to be a doormat for people. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, it's affected uh, my relationship in that way as well. Uh, it's, it's been a great thing. Very good. Julianne from Palm Beach Gardens in Florida basically wants to know where the chapters and numbers of verses come from in the Bible. Were those originally written in the way the Bible was written? No. Um, but people say, well, Father, when did they start? They actually there are partitions and different ways of segmenting scriptures going all the way back to the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, the way that we have the current chapters and verse numbers, which are consistent, actually developed much later into the Middle Ages. Um, Archbishop Langton, if I remember my seminary biblical class is correct, in around the 13th century actually developed chapter numbers just to be able to reference different parts of the Bible. And then later, um, there was a guy by the name of STN. I think he came, his first name was Robert. I think it was the 16th century. He actually assigned the verses to the Bibles and uh, passages. And that makes it way easier for us, you know, when we, when we can just reference something. And where's that in the Bible? Well, whoa, let me try to find it. No, that wouldn't work. But with the verse and the chapter numbers, it's consistent across all of our denominations who read the Bible. This next question is an interesting one. I have two answers for it. Anusha in Australia asks, if I could pick three famous people to have dinner with, who would they be? <laughs> Cameraman uh, Giuseppe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, three answers, not two answers. Um, if I were to pick, um, well, we're in a church, so let's start on the spiritual side. Uh, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, who wouldn't, wouldn't want to be at that family dinner. Um, if it were celebrities, I'd say... Uh, um, Bono, Arnold Schwarzenegger, I'm fascinated with that man, <laughs> uh, and uh, who would be the third one? Al Pacino, I think he kind of looked like him a little bit. <laughs> Ooh, what do you know? Um, yeah, I think that'd be a party, it'd be an interesting party. Very good. Chris from Grimes, Iowa says, I worry about past sins that I might not have confessed because I forgot about them Would you, uh, and maybe didn't tell the full, complete sin because of shame or that you just don't feel that you are truly forgiven. All right, huge difference between the first one there and his second and third one. First of all, if you have honestly, honestly <laughs> forgotten a sin, you are forgiven of it. Don't fall into that trap, though had a lady come up to me a while back at a parish mission. She came to me for confession, and she confessed a sin she confessed, or excuse me, committed 24 years ago. She confessed a sin. It was very grave. <clears throat> but remember, we don't know if a sin's mortal. Only God knows the inner heart. A mortal sin has to be grave. You have knowledge and free will. Okay, she comes. She confesses a sin. Very grave. And she said, Father, I, I committed this 24 years ago. I said, God bless you. Welcome back to confession after 24 years. She said, no. Father, I come every month. So I said, okay. God bless you. You must have just remembered this sin after 24 years. You know, it's a good idea, right? If you remember a grave sin you committed in your college fraternity days, good idea if you just remember it to go back and confess it. Good thing. She says, no. I've always known I had it. And I said, oh, okay. God bless you, ma'am. But you realize you don't have to keep confessing the same sin. 
once you confess it, it is forgiven unless you commit it again. Trust Jesus. Once you go to confession, it is guaranteed forgiveness. People always say, and I ask the question all the time, is it, when you go to the confessional, is it the priest who forgives the sin? Everybody says, no, yes. Because Jesus had ultimate authority on earth to forgive sins, he delegated that authority to the priest. So when the priest tells you you're forgiven and gives you the sign of absolution, you're guaranteed forgiveness. So I said to her, ma'am, you don't have to keep confessing the sin. She goes, no, I've never confessed it. At that point, I'm like, God bless you, ma'am, <laughs> but I'm out of answers. I said, why are you now confessing the, sin, confessing the sin? But God bless you, this is beautiful. Heaven's rejoicing. She says, I've always just been too embarrassed, and you look like a pretty easy priest. <laughs> I don't know if that's a compliment or not, but don't fall in that trap. Every one of her confessions for 24 years is invalid. If you knowingly have a grave sin on your soul, and we know the grave sins, I mean, go beyond just the obvious, like, you know, murder and whatnot, but there are a lot of sins that people don't even realize are grave matter. Do you know missing mass on Sunday? is grave matter, masturbation is grave matter, gluttony at the dinner table, gossip. These are all things people don't think of as grave matter. They are. If you have a grave matter sin that you're purposely not confessing, your, and, and, and your confession is invalid. So please get back to confession. If you have any of those in your hip pocket, okay, get them out there. Let the Lord forgive you. That's all he wants you to do is just come and be forgiven. People are like, I don't need the confessional, Father. That's how God set it up. He said in the book of James, go to the priests, confess your sins, and when you do, you are guaranteed forgiveness. Doesn't mean you can't say you're sorry outside of the confessional, but when you do it in the confessional, it's guaranteed. Thank, Thank you, you, Father. Jonathan, we have time for one last question. Okay. One last question, okay. Um, <laughs> I just wanna, okay. Okay, uh, I've heard you talk about your, oh, this is from Rose in Hesperia, California. I've heard you talk about your grandmother, I believe, saying you would be a priest. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel like God is calling you to the priesthood. Do you, Rose? <laughs> 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 um, I'll get back to you on that. I, um, do, you think you would be, do you think that would be a possibility, St. John Paul II was an actor, and he was also a playwright. He was an artist, for sure. Um, I just told Father earlier in the car on the way over here that I had a, pre, uh, a dream, a couple of dreams in the last few weeks that I was a priest. Interesting. Um, yeah, my grandmother, when I was, uh, we used to pray with our grandmother when we were young, uh, who was from Ireland, and she would visit and we would, uh, she would teach us prayers. And uh, she would tell my mother, because I, I loved praying as a kid, she's like, I think you might have a little priest on your hands there. And so it hasn't happened yet, but uh, God only knows. I think uh, right now, I'm pretty comfortable with my mission um, being an actor and, and reaching people in a different way. Um, what happens after this, I don't know. So we'll see. Okay. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. All right.